Uh, yes, I'm Ian McNeil. I'm an indie game developer. Uh, I was a backer for the Oculus Rift Kickstarter back in 2013. And uh, since then, as uh, Tony mentioned, I've developed two games. The first of those is Darknet, which is a cyberpunk hacking puzzle game. Um, and then more recently is Tech Terror, which is a tabletop real-time strategy game. Both of these were pretty smallish games. The budget in total, including the value of my time, was somewhere around $100,000 for development. And uh, that included me spending like a little over a year working full time, plus a handful of contractors working for a few weeks to a few months uh, at a time. So I'm drawing on my experience working on these titles. Keep in mind that that experience is mostly very small scale indie game development. So Darknet launched on the Gear VR in December 2014 and then launched as a launch title for the Oculus Rift in March of this year. And then Tactera launched on the Gear VR in May. And then for both of those games, I plan to have them out on Gear VR Rift, PSVR, and Vive. And then Google Daydream just came along, and so I had to complete the picture by promising both of these games for them. So that's 10 launches for a one-person company. And I think the first takeaway is that this was probably a bad idea. Um, I'm having a lot of trouble keeping up with this development schedule. But it did give me some perspective on developing for VR um, for multiple platforms. So if you are, say, a casual game developer who is considering getting into VR. Um, maybe you want to target everything, maybe not. And I think picking which platforms you're going to target is probably the biggest strategic choice you have to make starting out. So this talk is going to be most useful for developers who are just considering getting into VR or just starting out. If you're a VR veteran, then you already have your own personal experience, and hopefully I can add to that. But you'll probably know a lot of the information that I'm going to be talking about. So one reason that this is a really tough problem is because there's already this very large spectrum of cost and quality for VR platforms. So we have sort of Google Cardboard on one end is kind of the low cost, low quality option, going all the way up to things like, say, the Void, where you're taking over an entire warehouse and turning it into like a custom VR experience. And in between, there's a lot of stuff, most prominent being Daydream, Gear VR, Rift, PSVR, and Vive. And so, Let's start by narrowing this down somewhat. I'm leaving out the void and other out-of-home VR experiences because that's a smaller market and less approachable for little indie game devs like me. And then among the remainder, there's this big gap between the mobile smartphone-based VR and the rest. But I'm going to include both of them because I think they both have a lot of potential. And I think this gap can be bridged, as indeed I've tried to do with my own games. But I am going to leave out Google Cardboard. And you might ask, why not Google Cardboard? After all, they're the ones who've shipped like five plus million headsets so far. And the answer is because Cardboard's bad. It's cheap, but it's bad. It's a well-conceived product. It's made of cardboard, and it doesn't pretend to be any more than it is. But there's a lot of limitations from a developer's perspective. The technical quality of the experience is low enough that I don't want players seeing my game through that lens. There's a lot, lot of features that it doesn't have that limits what you can do from an input perspective. Um, there's a lot of smartphones that are involved with it, so it's hard to get consistent performance. And from what I've heard from developers who have games on Cardboard, the revenue hasn't been great so far. So maybe consider Cardboard if you're making a short, free app for exposure, or like a 360 video or something like that. Um, but otherwise, I think, thank God for Google Daydream and for all of the others that I'm going to be talking about. And I think these are all good, viable platforms. This talk is not going to end by saying, therefore, develop for this one. I think they're all useful, they're all you know, interesting, and um, a lot depends on your perspectives and beliefs and preferences as a developer and how those factors interact with the stuff I'm going to be talking about. So let's start by talking about the design implications of each platform. And by that I mean the way that the features of the platform affect the features in your game and how you know, the design of your game affects your choice of platform. So first of all, there's a few things they all have in common. One of them is they all have pretty good game engine support, especially with things like Unity and Unreal. So that makes it possible to be able to do cross-platform games. And then they're all VR. So if you're not a VR developer and you're considering becoming a VR developer, for all of these, you're going to have to figure out nausea, how to do UI, how to deal with 3D effects, et cetera. And there are other talks that can go into more depth about these sort of common issues that you have to figure out. Beyond that, talking about what makes each platform unique, starting with the Gear VR, I'm going to be talking about positional tracking, volume, input, and performance considerations for each of these. So for the Gear VR, there's no positional tracking and no wires. So it's no wonder then that John Carmack says the key accessory for the Gear VR is a swivel chair. 
It's really good for experiences where stuff is happening all around you, which might be why we've seen so many turret shooters and games like that so far. It comes with built-in touchpad controls, but you can also optionally link a Bluetooth gamepad. So the input is somewhat fragmented in that sense. If your game requires a gamepad, then you're paring down the audience that you, you know, can approach. I don't know what percentage of players have a gamepad. I can tell you that about 10% of the games on the Gear VR store require a gamepad right now. So if you want to hit everybody, your game has to work with just the touchpad and back button. But of course, that limits your game design uh, decisions. And then in terms of performance, you have to do a 3D scene rendered twice for stereoscopic 3D at 1440p at a consistent 60 frames per second on a cell phone, which is really difficult. Performance is going to be a concern for all of these platforms, but it is uniquely a concern for mobile VR. And with that said, Oculus and Samsung have done a lot to try to make this easier on developers. And you might be surprised, if you haven't been following the platform, how pretty the games can get on here. You can make some really visually attractive games for mobile VR. You just have to put more effort into it, and you have to design your game around these performance limitations from the very beginning. Google Daydream is the newcomer on the scene. And I think in terms of features, there's a pretty simple way of thinking about it, which is it's basically a Gear VR. It, um, it's high quality smartphone based VR. The one big difference is the input. So instead of the touchpad built in with you know, optional gamepad controls, they're including this remote like controller, which has the trackpad uh, or touchpad buttons and three degrees of freedom motion tracking. So it's kind of like a Wiimote. And so what is that good for? I can't really tell you because I haven't used it yet, but from what footage Google has shown so far, they're showing things like casting a fishing rod or flipping pancakes or waving around a magic wand. So is that going to be good for things like precision pointing, like picking out something from a detailed scene? Maybe, maybe not. Um, would you be able to use this to emulate the Gear VR's capabilities by just using the buttons and the touchpad and using gaze controls? Um, Maybe that you know, will work, but it could feel awkward or like a waste of potential if you're not using the built-in motion controls. So it's not yet clear what this input is good for, but it kind of points towards a different type of game. Oculus Rift and PSVR I'm grouping together because they share some key feature characteristics. They both have some positional tracking. It's high quality, but in a, a smaller volume than what you'll find on the Vive. It's not room scale. You can do like standing VR, but room scale is going to be a stretch. And um, having wires that you know, tether you to the device make it less ideal for experiences with a lot of turning around. So it tends to be better for 180 degree experiences, things where, you know, games where things are happening right in front of you. So that might sound like a lot of constraints, but that's actually ideal for a pretty wide range of games, like cockpit games, tabletop games, third person games where you're controlling an avatar, or anything that's happening in the near field, like Oculus Medium, the sculpting app, or like Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, the bomb defusal game. Um, in terms of input, both of these platforms include a gamepad with the device, um, but also are going to be offering tracked hand controllers as well. So again, you have this tricky decision. If your game truly requires hand tracking, then you're limiting yourself to a subset of the audience. And then both platforms are running high frames per second, high resolution, high performance on a consistent spec. For PSVR, it's the PlayStation 4, which is as consistent as you'll get. And then for Oculus, they've introduced the concept of Oculus-ready PCs. So the idea is you have this minimum spec that you can design your game against. And then if it runs there, it should run for everybody. For the HTC Vive, here is where we get actual room scale tracking, the only one where you get to walk around. There is some uh, complications here. For example, some players are not going to have the actual physical space that the device can theoretically support. So you know, not everyone is going to have a 15 by 15 foot room to walk around in. So you have to design your game to um, accommodate those people, maybe by allowing people to teleport around, or including artificial locomotion, or um, dynamically scaling the game experience to accommodate smaller spaces. Otherwise, you're locking out the people who don't have that room. It works for seated experiences as well. Um, and then for input, here it is not fragmented. We have these tracked hand controllers for everybody. And then again, we have high-end performance, where you can design against a certain recommended PC spec. They've actually included a uh, performance test on Steam so that players can go and see if their PC you know, hits this standard or not. So here's what all of that looks like condensed to a table. And this is kind of what I look at to decide whether or not uh, a game would be a good fit for different platforms. So for example, my game Darknet, although I am planning to bring it to all of these platforms, was originally designed around the Oculus DK1 and Gear VR feature set. 
And that kind of shows. To start with, it was built with this abstract low poly art style. So it runs with fast performance on mobile VR, and it'll run perfectly fast on the other machines, but it's not really taking full advantage of those, and the worry is that it might look like a mobile game. The input is ultra simple, so it works really well for game pads, and it can work with the touchpad, um, but it's probably going to feel like a waste if you have tracked hand controllers or motion controls. And, um, and similarly with positional tracking, it doesn't need positional tracking at all, great for mobile VR, um, but it doesn't really make good use of it when it's available. And so especially for the Vive, I'm kind of worried that the game's gonna feel weird, like you're floating in a void. There's no floor to walk around. There's nothing to walk up to and touch. So although the game will work on the Vive, I'm worried that players are going to be able to tell that this game was not designed for that device. Contrast that with my second game, Tactera, which was designed more recently, and so I had a better sense of the feature set that I was designing against. So in this case, again, I went with sort of mobile VR performance. And then for the input, simple gazing and selecting input works, but because everything is happening up close on this virtual tabletop, if you have tracked hand controllers, stuff is within reach. You can reach out and touch it. And so I think it will work well with stuff like Oculus Touch or the Vive controllers. With a day Daydream controller, I'm not as sure because I'm not, you know, I don't know whether it's going to be um, accommodating for this kind of game. And then for positional tracking, it doesn't need positional tracking, but it feels really good when you have positional tracking because stuff is happening very close to you and people want to lean in or walk around it. And it's flexible where I can expand the size of the table or the game space and really make good use of room scale tracking. And then if AR ever becomes a big thing, the game will be perfect for playing on your coffee table. So in this sense, the game is not perfect for any one platform, but it's very good for all of them. And that's a reason why I'm kind of bullish on this virtual tabletop format. I think it's pretty flexible. And then contrast that with something like, say, the Aperture Robot Repair demo, which is what Valve used to show off the HTC Vive. So for that, you need very high performance, you need the tracked hand controllers, and you need the room scale tracking to be able to walk around. It really cannot work on any device except for the Vive, which makes perfect sense. They were trying to make this demo to show what their device can do that no other device can. And I think this is a totally viable strategy for developers as well. I have chosen to go for multi-platform games, but I think it also makes sense if you want to pick one platform and try to just make something that's the best on that platform. Some unique killer app that can only be done with the Vive or something like that. Or maybe you're willing to make really substantive changes when you're porting between platforms. So for example, the developers of Job Simulator designed their game around the HTC Vive, but then they're building alternative versions of every single level in the game for the Oculus Rift so that it'll work with the smaller positional tracking volume and a 180 degree experience. So that's a lot more work, but potentially they can get the best of all worlds. So obviously when you're making this decision, what matters most is what kind of game you're excited about, what kind of game you're hoping to make. But I think you can change what kind of game you're designing, what features it's gonna have, and you can change which platforms you're choosing to target, but somehow you have to make those things meet in the middle. Otherwise, it's going to be very awkward for you and for your players. So, but features are not the only factors that inform your decision of platform. So let's talk also about the developer experience. And by this, what I'm talking about is um, working with the different companies. You're not just choosing to work with a piece of hardware, you're choosing a company to work with. I've had some direct experience with all of these companies, but I've also tried to make an effort to go talk with other, other developers to get their perspective. And by and large, the news I've heard is very good. All of these platforms seem to be generally developer friendly. I haven't heard anybody saying, stay away from these guys, they're just out to exploit you, they're gonna screw you over, nothing like that. Um, all of them seem to have a very high demand for games, which is probably why they're being nice right now and they need a big game library. And there's no big audience right now, so they're not attracting big developers um, in their own right. So indies like me are suddenly valuable again. Um, each company has some sort of funding program in action. Oculus, for example, announced they had a $10 million, or sorry, $100 million fund, which was it? No, it was a $10 million fund for accelerating indie game developers. And that money is still being distributed. And then each company has their own processes and strings to attach. Um, but the, all of them are offering funding in some way. And so, you need them to like your game if you're going to get funding or other support from them, and demos right now are the currency of the realm. If you want their attention and their support, you have to show them something that you're already building and get their attention that way, unless you're already a very established developer. And then they'll like you even more if you can use platform-exclusive features that show off why their hardware is better than anybody else's. 
So for example, um, the PSVR is the only one that can display 120 frames per second right now on its, uh, the display device. And so if you can get your game running at 120 frames per second on the PS4, Sony is more likely to promote you because now you're showing what they can do that nobody else can do. There are some differences between these platforms, though, uh, in terms of developer experience. Most of my experience personally has been working with Oculus for the Rift and the Gear VR. And by and large, that's been a really good experience for me. They've given me, uh, they've helped fund Darknet very early on. They gave me a lot of support with, with hardware and technical assistance and PR assistance and things like that. So it's been great for me. And Oculus has responded to say, like, that should never happen. We're happy to talk to anybody. But um, I feel like, you know, even though my experience has been really great, I should note that there's mixed opinion. For Sony, uh, their developer relations has really built up a good reputation among indies in the past few years. Um, but the warning that comes there is that getting your game on the console tends to come with higher public requirements. There's more hoops to jump through, more of a formal standardized process. For Valve, they also tend to get very good marks from developers, but they tend to be more hands-off in every way. Some people who I've talked to appreciate this, but I've also heard complaints from people who say that they prefer a different approach. They prefer you know, to have their hand held and get a little more personal attention. And then for Google's VR team, it's early enough that I don't really know. Um, I've heard good things so far. I've had a good experience with them you know, personally, but just not much of it, so I can't really say for sure. Maybe you can think of them as sort of the, the more risky, unknown option. Then I also wanted to talk about the business side of things, because if you want to pay the bills, you're going to need an audience to sell to. So I want to look into the audience size and you know, market potential of each of these platforms, but the truth is that we don't really know what's going to happen. A lot of this is still speculation, especially because the official numbers haven't really come out yet. So talking about the Gear VR to begin with, it went on sale as the Innovator Edition in December 2014, which is just like the Consumer Edition, but it had no marketing and it cost twice as much. And then in November 2015, the consumer launch finally happened. They cut the price in half. And they started marketing it in earnest, and sales picked up. And then recently, it's gotten a ton of marketing and support from Samsung. Most notably, it was bundled for free with pre-orders of the Galaxy S7, which had a huge effect in the market size for the Gear VR. Right now, uh, oh yeah, and Mark, uh, in May, Oculus announced that they had over a million uh, unique users in the previous month. There's a couple hundred apps that are on the store right now. Most of them are free. Among the paid apps, the average is about $5, and it maxes out at about $10. Um, I've heard that they're not seeing a ton of price sensitivity among these sort of early consumers, but I've also seen a couple of games that launched at $15 and then chose to drop their price to $10, so make of that what you will. My own game, Darknet, was one of the very first games that went up on sale for the Gear VR back in the Innovator Edition days. And at the time, it was the most expensive app on the store at a whopping $10. Um, and a lot of people were skeptical about that, but I'm glad in retrospect that I went for the, uh, the higher price to start with. And I really wanted to share sales stats, but um, do not have permission from Oculus to do so. What I can do is I can show you the revenue graph for the game without y-axis labels. So you're just seeing the shape of the line. And I still think that this can tell part of the story. So at first, the sort of early low period was the Innovator Edition days. It actually climbed upwards over that time, which was kind of cool to see as a developer. That's not usually the shape that you're used to seeing after launch. And then after November, when the consumer launch happened, that's when things sort of picked up significantly. And then the game had a few boosts in sales after that due to a New Year's sale and um, big batches of bundled Gear VRs showing up on the market. And then most recently, a, uh, the summer sale they did uh, just a few weeks ago. As for Tactera, um, a free demo was launched in December 2015. And then in May, at the very end of May, um, the game finally went on sale for uh, $10. And this happened a lot more recently, so here I'm showing the weekly revenue graph. And um, the shape is very different because unlike with Darknet, which launched when nobody had a Gear VR, Tactera launched when there was already a pretty big base of users, over a million Gear VRs out there. And it was featured at the, at the beginning for a week when it was launched. So it started out with a big launch spike, and then that dwindled a little bit over time, and has kind of plateaued a little bit. And it also participated in the summer sale, but with not as drastic an effect. So basically, I'm really happy with the progress of these games so far. Um, if I were a bigger company, if my company was more than just one person, then maybe I would feel like sales were kind of slow to start with. Um, but so far, it's felt pretty good, and there's a lot of platform launches still to come. And then uh, Darknet has gotten funding from Oculus, and both of these games have had some like side deals for like regional distribution rights and things like that. So if you include all of that revenue, 
uh, as well as the direct sales, so far both of the games have, have already paid back their development budget and broken even. Um, so this early foray into indie VR development has done pretty well so far. So moving on past the Gear VR to the Oculus Rift, uh, that launched in March. So far from the estimates I've seen from based on pre-order data and things like that, we're looking at a couple hundred or a few hundred thousand that have been sold. Um, they set expectations saying that if they sold one million units over the lifetime of the Rift, then that would be great. So I think that's sort of a good place to calibrate our own expectations. Darknet also launched on the Rift um, about four months ago uh, as a launch title. So this is what the shape of that graph looks like. I know this is good data because it looks like a piece of clip art. PSVR is uh, launching in October. It's coming in cheaper than the Rift and Vive, and then best of all, a built-in hardware base of over 35 million PS4s. So it's coming out later, but it might be the most accessible of the non-mobile VR platforms. And then it's getting a lot of support and promotion from Sony along the way. Based on Steam Spy data, it looks like it sold somewhere in the high five figures. So this is kind of the highest end option. Um, potentially, it's a strong position in a mostly enthusiast market, but it's lagging behind so far the uh, somewhat cheaper and more recognized, more hyped uh, Oculus Rift. Then Daydream is the newest contender launching this fall. Um, the Gear VR was so far the most widespread, but I think Daydream has the potential to be like the Gear VR, but even more accessible. You know, Gear VR had its consumer launch a year early and has this good head start, but Daydream is not going to be limited to just Samsung phones, so I think it has the potential to be huge. So how do we make sense of this? What is the VR market going to be like? I think when people talk about this, they like to try to make an analogy to markets that have come in the past. So, Maybe it'll be like the console wars, where we have these multiple platforms that are sort of stable and stiff competition. Or maybe it's going to be like the emergence of the app stores, and you want to get in early because it's going to be huge. Or maybe it's going to be like micro consoles, which also had big Kickstarter successes and a ton of hype, but then kind of went nowhere. Or it'll be like the earlier motion control peripherals, where it's sort of a subset of a subset of the market. Or maybe it's this totally new paradigm, unlike anything we've ever seen before. There's no point making analogies. And I think the truth is going to be some mixture of all of these. Like, yes, there's going to be these multiple competing platforms. Yes, it's going to be this big new emerging thing that you want to get in early. Uh, yes, it's going to be initially a subset of a subset of the gaming market for a while. And yes, there's probably going to be a flood of novelty shovelware for a while. Um, and it's also going to be new and different in its own way, but probably not like micro consoles. So to sum up, I'd say target mobile VR if your game doesn't require the high-end performance and tracking and input that comes with other platforms. And if you want to get into this more mass market, accessible, dare I say, casual vision of VR, go for the Oculus Rift or PSVR if you have a high-end game that doesn't require room scale tracking, um, if you need funding or support from either of these companies, or if you believe in the platform particularly. I think there's a legitimate case to be made that the Rift is the most comfortable and polished hardware of the bunch, or that the PSVR hits the sweet spot of accessibility and um, quality. And then target the Vive if your game takes full advantage of room scale tracking and hand controls, and if you believe in those features. There's a lot of people who are advocates of room scale who will tell you that the Vive is the only device that really takes full advantage and fulfills the potential of VR. So if you believe that, go for the Vive. And target all of them if you are especially ambitious, or contradictorily, if you want to hedge your bets. If you think VR is going to be big, but you don't know which platform is going to be the winner. Um, and if your game is flexible enough that you can make it work on multiple platforms. I think VR has a lot of potential. There's a lot of promise on all of these platforms from mobile VR to room scale. So that's the path that I've chosen to take. And I've run out of time for questions, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you all.